Muhammad encouraged Muslims to create social bonds through their work within their communities. In his young age, before he received the message of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, along with his uncles, attended a meeting of a social organization called the Alliance of Virtue. This organization was established to help the oppressed and to foster justice in and around Mecca. After receiving the revelation, the Prophet showed his esteem with such organizations and said, I had witnessed, along with my uncles, a meeting of the Alliance of Virtue in the house of Abdullah ibn Judan, whom I loved more than the most precious thing, and if I were to be called to join it in Islam, I would. Muslims believe in fostering good traits and condemn evil acts. In fact, one of the lesser pillars of a Muslim is fostering good and forbidding bad. This is known as al Amir bil Maruf wa Anahi an al Munkar, meaning commanding the doing of what is right and forbidding what is wrong. This philosophy allows the Muslim to practice what is known by all people to be good, such as obeying traffic laws, penalizing the criminal, stating the truth, etc., and also rejects what is known as bad or immoral, such as intoxication, harming neighbors, stealing, and lying. Some scholars say Ma'ruf is that which is recognized by all people as good, and Munkar is that which is recognized by all people as bad. Islam by now has a strong footing in Arabia, and the Muslims enjoyed the peaceful years after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was signed. However, this peace would not last. Two years after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was enacted, one of the Quraysh tribes breached it, attacking and killing 20 people from a tribe from the Muslims' camp. The treaty uh, is basically, at a certain point, uh, seen as violated by the Meccans, who undertake a series of attacks or getting others to attack the Medinan community. And so, in effect, the Prophet says this is abrogated, uh, the Medinan community moves on Mecca, and at the end of the day, the Meccans, uh, uh, you know, realizing that they, that they are facing a highly motivated community, and in a sense, overwhelming uh, odds, uh, are subdued, surrender. The Prophet moved into Mecca with as many as 10,000 people and entered the city peacefully. He entered the city with his head bowed down in humility to God and with respect for the city's sacred house of God. He forgave the Meccans with his famous words, Go about wherever you may please, for you are set free. Muhammad's action in forgiving the Meccans was magnanimous, since Muhammad was at the peak of his power and he could have easily crushed the Meccans. In contrast, the Meccans, at the peak of their power, executed the Muslims, who were weak and defenseless. The genius of the Prophet here as a leader is very interesting because he does not choose to do what many at that time might have, might have chosen to do, and that is to simply subdue and slaughter in a, in a way to get revenge, to retaliate and get back. But rather he takes the high ground. The Prophet accepts the surrender, uh, a fairly uh, significant number of notables convert to Islam, and the Prophet indeed um, offers positions of significance to a number of the Meccans. And so in many ways, the Meccans now become absorbed within uh, uh, that broader Islamic community. During the Muslims' peaceful re-entry into Mecca, the Prophet announced, anyone who enters the house of Abu Sufyan, who is the leader of the Meccans, is safe. Here, we see that the Prophet was acknowledging the stature of the leaders of Mecca, and he showed that the Muslims were not to abuse the social and political structure of the society. Once the city was opened, Muhammad appointed Atab ibn Asid, a member of the Quraysh tribe, to rule the city, rather than placing himself or his regime to rule over Mecca. God emphasizes in the Quran the sacredness of the human soul and condemns acts of terror. If anyone slays a human soul, unless it be in punishment for murder or for spreading corruption on earth, it shall be as though he had slain all mankind. Whereas, if anyone saves a life, it shall be as though he had saved the lives of all mankind. Quran 532. Muslims believe that any regulation or act made for saving a human life, such as traffic regulations, medicinal child-proof bottling, and the protection of the ecological system are examples for saving the human life. 
A Muslim is rewarded for inventing and practicing such measures and showing respect for the human soul. The Islamic law, Sharia, is a community moral law derived from the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad. The Sharia is not just a legal system. It's an orientation towards God. Literally, Sharia means the path to the watering hole, which means that by taking certain actions, we can come closer to the source of, of divine goodness and justice. So that includes not only um, creating laws in society like criminal laws and contract laws, but also um, forming our family life, uh, our community life, looking at our relationship with our neighbors. One interesting thing about Islamic law is that Muslims have moral and legal obligations to their neighbors. Uh, it's impermissible for a Muslim to um, go to sleep while his or her neighbor is hungry. Your neighbor in Islamic law has a right to come and demand, in fact, food from you if, if they're in need. So that that idea that, that the legal system is a way to create a sense of community, a sense of responsibility um, beyond the individual, although of course individual rights are, are also protected. The Sharia is built around the protection of five vital elements. There are five important things in Islam that must be very strictly protected. The blood of the people, the life of the people, their property, their religion, their honor, you know, which is related to family, related to themselves, no defamation, no uh, gossip, no spread of rumors against somebody, all of these things. And then uh, people's uh, mind towards their understanding, their knowledge, all of these things that has to be protected. Muslims believe that the severity of punishment for certain crimes in the Islamic law is for deterrent purposes. The Quran says that in the uh, um, punishments of retribution that there is life for people, meaning that some, some crimes, uh, if they become widespread in a society, can cause great damage. Not only can individuals be harmed, but people will feel insecure. They won't be able to live a normal life in society. It has been proven that people are less likely to commit unlawful violations so long as the penalty is stiff. For example, in California, a traffic citation point in 2004 requires 18 months to be removed off a violator's record versus six months requirement in the mid-1970s. Similarly, the level of intoxicant found in a drunk driving citation was lowered to 0 .08 in the early part of 2000 from 0 0.12 in the mid-1970s. To Muslims, avoiding punishment is part of the judicial system. The Prophet teaches jurists to avoid the punishment by any suspicions. The Islamic law also offers an alternative for capital punishment by means of pardon or monetary compensation. If someone commits a deliberate act of murder in uh, uh, an Islamic legal system, uh, the family of the victim has the right to forgive that person. Um, they also have the right to demand punishment or they can ask for compensation. And the Quran states that it's preferable for the people to forgive. Why is that? Because forgiveness itself is an act of, uh, of, it frees the people who have been harmed from a sense of anger, a sense of victimization. It empowers them to, um, to have some control over the situation by giving that act of forgiveness. The Quran emphasizes peaceful dialogue. Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and discuss with them in ways that are the best and most gracious. Quran 16.125 Say, O people of the book, come to common terms as between you and us that we worship none but God, that we associate no partners with Him, that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than God. If then they turn back, say, bear witness that we are at least Muslims bowing to God's will. Quran. 364. Some people still want to believe that Islam 
is a threat to the West um, and that Islam is a religion that promotes violence or teaches violence. This is far from the truth. Um, Islam, uh, the very word, comes from peace, the word meaning peace, and Islam is a religion of peace. Muhammad the prophet embraced Christians, he embraced Jews. Uh, Jews and Christians lived in Muslim, among Muslims and under Muslim authority and had the freedom to practice their religion and conduct their affairs as they did before Islam. If dialogue between Christians and Jews was the mandatory work after the Holocaust, dialogue between Jews and Christians and Muslims is the mandatory work in our own day and time. My own Christian tradition says, treat your enemy with respect and love and turn your enemy into your friend. There's a table where we can sit down and talk long before we have to get to acts of desperation. We are all our brother's keepers. We all must love our neighbors. And we have an ethical obligation um, not to destroy uh, one another. For 70 years, Muslims and Christians perform their rituals and prayers side by side before the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Syria was expanded in 705. Caliph al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik bought the St. Baptist Church, which was east of the mosque from the Christians in exchange for four other churches in the city. Today, the tomb of John the Baptist stands in the center of the Umayyad Mosque along with the original baptismal well and stone-made pot. One of its minarets is known as the Minaret of Jesus. Muslims believe that Prophet Jesus will be returning to earth and will start his mission from this holy place. Muslims are then supposed to follow him as well as Christians. In an effort to bridge between Muslims and Christians, Sheikh Ahmad Kuftaro had called on both Muslims and Christians to work together paving the road for his return. History shows that when Muslims and Christians clashed, they discovered that they share much of the same values. The Crusaders and Saladin is an example. In the book, Saladin in his time, P. H. Nupi stated, the Crusaders were fascinated by a Muslim leader who possessed virtues they assumed were Christian. Saladin's image was in the millennium issue of Time magazine. Time magazine wrote about Dante's Divine Comedy and said, but perhaps what should be most surprising in his catalog of great-hearted souls was a figure solitary, set apart. That figure was Saladin. When Dante, the most Christ-centered verse ever penned, wrote lionizing his name, Saladin had been dead for over 100 years. Dante's writings stand today as it did in the past as a testament to Saladin's extraordinary stature. When Saladin captured Jerusalem from the Franks, he spared the lives of 100,000 Christians. Richard the Lionheart negotiated peace with Saladin. Saladin could have exploited the situation since he had the upper hand. However, he followed Islam's quest for peace and spared their lives. God said, it may be that God will grant love and friendship between you and those whom you hold as enemies. For God has power over all things, and God is oft forgiving, most merciful. Quran 67. In contrast, when the Crusaders entered the city 88 years earlier, they massacred 80,000 of the original inhabitants of the city. Among the slaughtered were Christians and Jews. Salahuddin or Saladin, I think, is a very important figure to look at in Islam. Why? Because, you know, a lot of times when we talk about religion, people will say, yeah, but you're talking about abstract thought, or you're talking about a set of beliefs. But how did Muslims actually act? Just as we can say, how did Christians actually act? And regrettably, we can go back and pick out, and there are, you know, the negative images, the negative people, the negative examples. But we also have the great leaders, the enlightened leaders. And Salahuddin, or Saladin, represents that kind of enlightenment. When we look at the way in which uh, the Muslims were viewed, those who were following uh, 
this Muslim ruler by even the Christian army and by um, the head of, uh, of the Christian army. Uh, he was very well respected in his own time. Not only is a great warrior, but a man with a great sense of chivalry and moral code. And indeed, uh, when the Muslims were victorious, uh, he did not do what many at that time would have done, and that is, you know, slaughter the soldiers, uh, slaughter the women and children, uh, but in fact, uh, spared uh, those who were conquered. In September 1192, during the Siege of Acre, King Richard the Lionheart gained a lasting respect for Saladin. When Richard fell sick, Saladin sent him his own physician, Ibn Maymun, the Maimonides, to treat him. Along with this health care, he frequently sent him ice to cool down his fever and plum fruits that were necessary for his recovery. Saladin went beyond justice in helping Christian women find their husbands. He ordered his soldiers to search for their missing ones. Those whose husbands or guardians were determined dead, Saladin ordered they receive compensation in currency from the treasury as if they were killed, not as soldiers of war, but by error or accident. During the Siege of Acre, several soldiers were captured. Among them was an old man who was so old that he was toothless and could hardly walk. Saladin questioned him as to why he was there. The old man said that he had no thought but to make a pilgrimage to the Church of the Resurrection in Jerusalem. Saladin was so touched by his answer and condition that he ordered that the old man be escorted to Jerusalem to fulfill his worship dream. Saladin entered the annals of Western history as a magnanimous and respected figure. Saladin's chivalry and high standards were at the soul of the plays and romances created by Sir Walter Scott. The French historian René Grousset wrote this about Saladin's character. It is equally true that his generosity, his piety, devoid of fanaticism, that flower of liberality and courtesy which had been the model of our old chroniclers won him no less popularity in Frankish Syria than in the lands of Islam. One thing that Islam brought which was revolutionary were rights to women. In the societies in much of Europe, Asia and Africa, women's rights were non-existent until modern times. With the rise of Islam in the early 600s, the Arabian woman was recognized as equal partner to man. Islam had granted the woman a dignified role and established her right to inherit, marry, and divorce. Prophet Muhammad said, women are the partners of men. In the days before the Prophet, uh, women, men were really looking for virgins to marry. Uh, when a woman was married, uh, she couldn't remarry. Once she had been divorced or once her husband had died, she was left unable to marry again. Women were certainly second-class citizens. With the advent of Islam, Islam allowed women the right to inherit. It gave women the right to their own earnings. And it gave women the right to uh, accept a marriage, not have it imposed on them, and the right to request a divorce when they want it. And if women are given the same rights that, as males or uh, men to education, to education, then no woman can be held back. Whatever applies to a man applies to a woman in religious duties and in relationships. A woman can be a doctor, a lawyer. Uh, she can have her own business. Uh, she can be an entrepreneur. Uh, she can work in a laboratory. She, she can do anything that any other woman can do. The Quran names several chapters in honor of women. Al-Nisa, or the woman, is one chapter. Or as the late Sheikh Ahmad Kuftaro taught, in defense of women. This chapter conveys many subjects regarding women's affairs and rights. Another chapter in the Quran devoted to women is named Al-Mujadila or the woman with plea. In this chapter, Allah narrates the story of a woman who came to Prophet Muhammad complaining about her husband. The woman did not like the ruling of the Prophet in her case. 
She kept returning to the prophet, arguing her case until a revelation in her behalf was revealed, changing the ruling of the prophet in her favor. There is yet another chapter in the Quran named Mary, after the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus. These chapters constitute a giant step in the liberation of women from the earlier beliefs of superstition. Men shall have a share of what their parents and kinsmen leave. Women shall have a share of what their parents and kinsmen leave. Whether it be little or much, it is legally theirs. Quran 4-7 Prophet Muhammad said, Only a man of noble character will honor women and only a low, vile man will dishonor them. Because of their role in home education and upbringing of children, Islam gives mothers greater honor than fathers. A man came to Prophet Muhammad and asked him, O Messenger of God, who rightfully deserves the best treatment from me? Your mother, replied the Prophet. Who is next? asked the man. Your mother, said the Prophet. Who comes next? the man asked again. Your mother, replied the prophet. And who is after that? insisted the man. Your father, said the prophet. Prophet Muhammad also said, Heaven lies beneath the feet of mothers. Muslims believe obeying and serving mothers is a key to deserving paradise. God commands the obedience of parents. We have enjoined on man respect and kindness to his parents. In pain did his mother bear him, and in pain did she give him birth. Quran 46.15 Muslim women have risen to the highest government ranks. Umu Salama, Prophet Muhammad's wife, advised the Prophet in important political and legislative matters. In the peaceful treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet acted upon her advice in making the treaty a reality. While women should be responsible for raising the family, Islam teaches that the man should be responsible for the well-being of the family. These duties are based upon only on his physical ability of management and livelihood, not on superiority because he is a man. Women shall with justice have rights similar to those exercised against them although men have a degree and responsibility above women. Allah is mighty and wise. Quran 2-228 Just like a pilot is responsible before the law for the safety of an airplane and the passengers, the man is given the responsibility of his family before God. Otherwise, both parents mutually share the management of the family, just like the pilot and co-pilot manage the aircraft in the air. Also, it takes hydrogen and oxygen to make a particle of water, but neither of the elements is superior to the other. The two elements only complement one another. Muslim women wear the scarf as a means of modesty. The scarf does not construe a limitation or incapacity with respect to her, nor does it make her inferior to man or other women. In the centuries before Islam, a man could have as many wives as he chose. Islam limited polygamy to four wives. To prescribe only four wives is a limitation, not a license. Unless the man is able to support and deal justly with all of his wives, he should remain monogamous. Many believe that polygamy is a means of social and financial assistance available for the unfortunate women. Similar to the financial assistance programs provided for single mothers by a particular state, Polygamy serves not only as a financial aid, but psychological and intimate as well. As well as the spiritual, social, and political contributions of Islam, Muslims believe that the quest for knowledge is an integral part of their faith. This philosophy opened the way for art and science that eventually led the way to the Renaissance. Islam invented the book. It began with the word Iqra, reading, using the pen. And so the Muslims became big converts to, to learning. And so not only were they doing the sciences, but they were doing a lot of literature. The Arabian Nights, the poetry of Omar Khayyam.
in terms of which sciences the Muslims invented. They invented all of the basic sciences according to Brefault, Goldstein, Durant, and others. That includes astronomy, physics, geometry, geography, geology, the science of algebra, we know that, also the science of trigonometry, and medicine, pharmacy, are all Islamic productions. Muslims believe contemplating the universe is a way to reach to God. The Quran points to signs on earth and heaven that make people think, investigate, and explore. Behold, God said, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the alteration of the night and the day, in the sailing of the ships through the ocean for the profit of mankind, in the rain which God sends down from the skies, and the life which he gives there to an earth that is dead, in the beasts of all kinds that he scatters through the earth, in the ordinance of the winds, and the clouds obedient between heaven and earth, these indeed are signs for people who have sense. Quran 2, 164. Prophet Muhammad has said, seek knowledge, even if you have to go to China for it. The Muslims actually went out, found knowledge in each culture, and brought it into a, a continuum. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, said the Prophet Muhammad. He also said, lo, the angels offer their wings to the seeker of knowledge. The Hindu culture came in with the Persian, then with the Arabic, and then with the you know, Greek and the European. It all belt, you know, bent together, the ancient pharaonic culture. All that knowledge came together that led to the sciences. It was the Quran that leveled the playing field. That's the difference. Muslims believe the Quran considers earthly issues important as well. The Quran named chapters after what constitutes the nerve of the economy in Arabia at the time of its revelation. The cattle is an example, or in modern terms, the cattle industry. Other names, such as the ore, or as the late Sheikh Ahmad Kuftaro translated as ore and mining, and Saba, in reference to the people of Yemen who built the Marib Dam for future agricultural and industrial projects. You will see so many sewers named after the cosmos, named after the sun, the stars, the moon, uh, the wind, a long chapter called uh, the cattle for the Muslim to study the benefit of the cattle. Prophet Muhammad encouraged his followers not to be financially dependent on others, but to seek work and thrive. After all, he was a merchant himself. His inspirations in this regard are, poverty can be as bad as disbelieving in God. The Muslim who gives in charity is better than the one who receives charity. And he used to make this prayer, Our Lord, help us achieve prosperity in this life and in the hereafter. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, when the person dies, all of his actions will stop, except three things will continue after death. Number one, a righteous son who prays for his father or his mother. Number two, a continuous charity. Number three, a useful knowledge. The Muslims' day was highly dependent on time, since their prayers are at specific times during the day. As a direct act of faith, Muslims invented the clock. There were clocks in the Persian Empire, in the ancient Greek Empire, uh, and there were sundials. But in terms of a clock, the kind that we have today, that's Islamic. The Saljug scientists, including al Qayyim in the 11th and 12th century were responsible for the creation of the solar calendar that was used widely until today. Muslim astronomers also devised a more popular calendar for the farmers, known in the West as the calendar of the Cordoba, which served as the model for the modern farmer's almanac. In fact, the word almanac is from the Arabic word al-manakh, meaning the climate. This evidence reveals the influence of the Islamic world on the West in the keeping of time. Muslims founded the world's greatest trade route that spread from China and Central Asia to Baghdad, sometimes known to historians as the Golden Web. This was one of the most lucrative trade routes that existed during that time. 
It allowed gigantic trains of over 60,000 people and as many animals to travel on a regular basis from the great cities of China and Central Asia to Baghdad. From Baghdad, some of the goods would then be shipped on to other destinations, including Constantinople in Eastern Europe, Yemen, North Africa, and South Asia. The influence of Muslim trading was felt on the southern fringes of Europe along the Mediterranean Sea, in southern France, and on the coasts of Italy, Sicily, and North Africa. Never before Islam had so many people spread over a territory that made such a large range of products available to the consumer. What Islam did was it opened up the trade routes, both the caravans and through shipping. Spices were traded, and it also opened up Europe. Europe was based on a bland diet and didn't know anything about any spices until of its contact with the Muslims of Sicily, of the boot of Italy, and of Spain. Islamic shipbuilding techniques were unparalleled anywhere in the world during that time. The Muslims actually took the techniques that the Indians and the Chinese used and modified them. They created the first rudder. They created the Latin sail, modifying that to be a more productive sail. They created the first uh, compass. The Chinese made the magnetic needle but didn't use it in navigation. The Muslims created it for navigation. Drugs were manufactured by the Muslims and shipped all the way to Scandinavia, all the way to South Africa, all the way to China. So they created an industry of drug manufacture. To overcome the difficulties while traveling over the vast distances between cities and territories throughout the trade routes, not to mention the annual Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca, the natural course was for the invention of geography and map making. Muslims excelled in geography in order to travel around natural barriers. Columbus's voyage was made up of navigators, sails, and maps that were of Islamic origin. The maps that were used were copies from Al Idris's original maps. According to Cetelot, Al Idrisi was a resident at the court of the Christian King Roger II of Sicily during the middle of the 12th century. He was a highly dedicated scholar and wrote a huge encyclopedia. He was paid by King Roger the weight of his map in solid silver. Everything that Columbus did was 50% Islamic. So even until the 1500s, after the Americas were discovered, the European map industry was based on copying Ottoman maps. The Latin sail was taken by the Europeans and developed by the Spanish and Portuguese between 1440 and 1490. The word admiral came from the Arabic words Amir al-Bahar, or the prince of the sea. Similarly, the English word chemistry, sherbet, soda, coffee, jar, mirror, carrick, benzene, zero, monsoon, and genie all came from Arabic. Because of the different money used in each region of the Golden Web and beyond, Muslims invented the check and the banking institutions in order to achieve a unified method of payment. The check is the most common tool of trade and commerce in the world today. The word check came from the Arabic word suck. A check would be issued in Baghdad for a particular commodity, and it would be cashed elsewhere in Indonesia, Yemen, India, or Europe. The development of partnerships and joint stock companies was another direct outcome of this financial invention of the check. Examples from the 9th and 10th centuries were the partnerships between the Muslims of Damascus, Syria, and Christian merchants of Italy. Ibn al-Haq in the Book of Roots and Kingdoms cited some private accounts in North Africa of an astonishing 400,000 dinars for precious metals exported from the Senegal. Baghdad was known as the source of wisdom. Scholars, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, atheist, uh, believer, they all came and converged on Baghdad to learn the sciences. Muslims brought to Spain the concept of municipal administration and measures of control of commerce. Today, we find many English words reflecting the economic and commerce influence of Islam on Europe. The Greek method of acquiring scientific knowledge was mainly speculative. Science as such could make little headway. 
The Muslims, who were more realistic and practical in their approach, adopted the experimental method. The scientific method was developed in the Islamic Empire in the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries in detail by Islamic scientists and published in their books. They were the first to use deductive reasoning, the first to do precise scientific experiments, the originators of the original scientific textbooks, and they produced the first scientific, well-controlled trials, both in medicine with animals and humans, and in physics and astronomy, uh, as well as in uh, other fields. Some of the sciences developed by the Muslims were a direct result from the need of fulfilling their spiritual duties. Performing formal prayers, for example, Muslims face Kaaba, the house of worship built in Mecca by Prophet Abraham. This direction to Kaaba is called Qibla. Al-Biruni established longitudinal and latitudinal global lines for the Qibla in the 10th century. In order to find Qibla from any part of the globe, Muslims invented the compass and developed the sciences of geography and geometry. In 803 AD, Caliph Mamun's quest for knowledge led him to the opening of a special academy in Baghdad, the House of Wisdom. Its purpose was to translate the Greek documents into Arabic and further develop them into a science. He appointed a Christian, Hunayn ibn Ishaq, as the head of the academy. Caliph Mamun used to pay the weight in gold of a book to be translated. If there was a good Greek book, a good Syriac book, it wasn't going to rot anymore in the monastery. The incentive was, if it's 50 pounds, you get 50 pounds of gold. Yeah, that turned some people on. And Christians and Jews and Muslims uh, did the translations. As well as the founding of the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, Caliph al-Mamun commissioned a staff of astronomers to test the findings of Ptolemy the ancient Greek astronomer. He built an observatory in Al-Mosul, Iraq. One of the observatory staff was Al-Fargani. In 830 AD, he published texts that served as the authority for astronomy in Europe and Asia for nearly 700 years. According to Gerard de Valcolours in his book, Discovery of the Universe, Al-Batani was a great astronomer and mathematician. He published an original Almagest, and developed the science of trigonometry and introduced the sign. He also discovered the inequality in the moon's motion known as variation. He made new observations for the sun's position and improved the value of the tropical year, rectified Ptolemy's precession constant and measured the obliquity of the elliptic more accurately. Until the 12th century, Ibn Tufail, Ibn Rushd, and Maimonides revolted against the Ptolemaic theory of homocentric model that the planets rotate around with the Earth as the center rather than the sun. Judd G.A. in the book History of Civilization regarded Al-Jabr Ibn Hayyan as the father of chemistry. He discovered as many as 19 elements and is credited with correct measurements of specific weights in the periodic table for these elements. He perfected chemical processes such as distillation, crystallization, and sublimation. He was the first to distill vinegar into acetic acid. He introduced the relative solubility and insolubility of substance and solutions and was the first to use glass tubes and bottles on a large scale. The famed physician Ar-Razi was also a chemist. He wrote the book Sir Al-Asrar, The Secret of Secrets, which revealed much of the properties, colors, and types of minerals and mineralogy discovered by all previous civilizations. This book was the first example of a chemistry lab manual. The chemicals he experimented with included nitric and sulfuric acid. His laboratory included burners, water baths, a hearth, a kiln, bellows, filters, ceramic dishes, flasks, and vials. All these devices are part of the modern lab. Four centuries later, in the 13th century, Roger Bacon translated the secret of secrets into Latin with the title, Ceritum Secretum. One of the greatest contributions to science Muslims made to the world is the creation of mathematical science, algebra, geometry, 
algorithm, and arithmetic are at the heart of every scientific and social aspect of life. Zero was used by the Hindu mathematicians for commerce, but not for algebra, not for uh, surveying and for, uh, for science. And it was the Muslims of the ninth century, Abu Wafa, Al Khwarizmi, and others, who actually turned algebra into a science, added the zero, later on added decimals. They actually turned it into a science. The word algebra from Al Jabr, the word arithmetic originates from Al Khwarizmi. So does the word logarithm. There is hardly a single device, business entity, industry, or architecture built without the Arabic numerals, the decimal point, the sine and cosine, the ruler and the compass, all of which are Islamic inventions. True, systematic, easy to understand geometry is, is partly Greek, partly Phoenician, partly uh, Egyptian, but as a science, it's Islamic. Ibn al-Haytham, who was also a physicist and astronomer, used his math genius for the development of optics. In his book, Book of Optics, he demonstrated the second law of refraction for the eyes and for the rainbow. He also described the functions of the eye, such as the connectives, iris, corona, and lens. He also shows the interrelation between the various parts. What happened was Euclid had some idea of the physics of the eye, but he was in error. Galen was in error. Uh, Al-Haytham said, no, let me look at their theories, and he changed the, th he, he did experiments. The experiments proved that Galen and Euclid were in error, and he created the first correct uh, theory for binocular vision. How the, and the Greeks said that the eye shoots photons out. Al-Haytham of Egypt said, no, the sun sends particles into the eye that gets transmitted into an image at the back of the brain. He was the inventor of optics, absolute. Ibn al-Haytham and his student Kamalu ad-Din teamed up making history again when they first observed the basis for the modern camera, the obscura phenomenon. The Obscura Phenomenon, defined by Webster's Dictionary as Dark Chamber, usually is a cardboard with a tiny pinhole. This was the foundation for the camera. Another branch of Arab learning was medicine. Hospitals and pharmacies were developed by Muslims in the 8th and 9th centuries. The first hospital ever built was in Baghdad in 706. Wooten said that pharmacy was discovered and turned into a science by the Muslims of Spain, by the Muslims of Baghdad. They produced the first pharmacies. There were 80 pharmacies with licenses to practice pharmacy. They created distillation, calcination, sublimation. These are technical pharmacy terms. They created the ability to make drugs. They used alcohol by distilling it from grain uh, into a purified form in surgery and to cauterize wounds and also to take extracts of herbs. The early Muslim concept of the hospital became the prototype for the development of modern hospitals. The original hospital in terms of a scientific hospital is exclusively an Islamic production. It had a bit of a model in Persia, the Christian monks and so forth and conducted a hospital, but turning it into a scientific institution with a botanical garden with a nursing staff, with charts on each patient, with medical students in tow, with accurate record keeping, with scientific studies taking 50 patients and testing half with a certain herb, half with something else, testing bloodletting to see if it really worked, for example, which Arazi did and found it working for meningitis. That's exclusively an Islamic production. In fact, the hospitals were so popular for the Europeans that they would fake illness to get into the hospitals, the magnificent hospitals in Cordoba, in Cairo, and in Damascus. One of Europe's best medical schools in France was founded by Arab doctors. Islam's influence on Europe was indeed responsible for the escape of Europe from the Dark Ages. Briefo, in his book, The Making of Humanity, states, it was not science only which brought Europe back to life. Other and manifold influences from the civilization of Islam communicated its first glow to European life. The development of Hebrew grammar and scientific theories of linguistics and philology 
really developed out of the Islamic world because the Muslims were uh, the first, really, in bringing scientific ideas of linguistics to the study of scriptural text in the Quran. Islam cannot clash with Western civilization. Well, the whole question of whether Islam is in clash with Western civilization, it can't clash with itself. It is Western civilization. It produced the first Western civilization in Spain and Sicily and in Italy. It produced the sciences. It produced the post office, the bank, the check, the uh, airmail system, the first one. It produced the use of mathematics to, to do computerization ultimately. So when we take a jet or if we do a math class or if we're on a computer, we're Islamic at that point. From the 8th through the 13th centuries in Spain under the Muslim Moors, some of Islam's greatest thinkers revolutionized Christian scholasticism. Some of those are Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, Ibn Hazm, and Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd, known by the Latin as Averroes, was a philosopher, an Aristotelian, and an author of some of the most influential medical works. Among Ibn Rushd's followers were Jewish thinkers who called him the soul and intelligence of Aristotle. In fact, Jewish philosophers such as Ibn Maymun, known as Maimonides and Avispran, who were the main glory of Jewish intellect, were students of Ibn Rushd. Maimonides is a, a powerful example of a great Jewish uh, leader and contributor to the general world both of Judaism, Islam, and even secular culture as well. Maimonides, of course, was the first Jewish physician uh, to the Sultan of Egypt. There was a kind of de facto collaboration between Jews and Muslims and Christians in scientific endeavor during the Middle Ages. Islam enlightened the world with spirituality and social and industrial sciences and added to the Judeo-Christian world a 1.7 billion Muslim population who adored and revered Jesus and Moses and all other Israelite prophets. We have a world which is so small. We have people of all faiths living in all places. And we have the opportunity to learn from one another, to make friends with one another. It used to be it was separated by geography. But the geography is no longer separating us now. Uh, Christians are living all over the world, Muslims are living all over the world, Jews are living all over the world and interacting with each other. I believe positive-minded uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians have an obligation to work together. The word salam clearly is related to shalom and for us that means in the Hebrew wholeness, peace. I, I tell them that a tree cannot live without a root and the root of religion is love. We all have a responsibility to listen. As a, as a people, we can't go back to segregating ourselves. That we must come together more regularly, that that is something that will feed us, um, and, and for tomorrow to be a hopeful tomorrow rather than a fearful tomorrow, this is the only way to be. Uh, all religious communities, Jews, Christians, Christians and Muslims, are forced today to re-examine those uh, early points of contact and to reclaim the best of, the, uh, of those points of coexistence uh, and rationales for coexistence that exist within the tradition and to build on that in the 21st century. I think that what we have to do to get together is have humility. All of the faiths have to have more humility. There is a place for acceptance of other religions within monotheism, within every expression of monotheism, but you don't always see it. We are friends, and we love one another, and help one another. We are members of the same family, sharing the great grandparenthood of a pair of people, Adam and Eve. There are so many parallels, religious, social, moral, and ethical, in the three monotheistic religious traditions, it seems just a shame that we haven't done a better job of working together. We're all part of the same family, and we really have our differences. Sometimes those differences are substantial. Very often those differences are really quite petty. It's absolutely critical that we learn to 
be a little bit more generous and respectful of the other so that we can learn to live together and to work together on common cause. I think when we draw on the best heart of our faith traditions, we have the resources from God that we need to achieve peace and to live at peace with one another. And this is, isn't this the desire of everyone who is a lover of God, is to live at peace with God and at peace with our neighbors. And the dynamic interaction between these religions could perhaps reveal something new in our own age that no one has discovered in ages past. It's a, it's a threshold to a brand new reality, and I believe it has God all over it. During this film, we have taken you on a journey from the Prophet Muhammad's teachings and the birth of Islam through the Renaissance until today. Without Islam, the world as we know it would be very different than it is today. Islam affected major spiritual and social changes and was responsible for a multitude of inventions, forming some of today's languages, our own numbers and mathematical equations, hospitals and pharmacies as we know them today, commerce and trade and countless other achievements. Europe's recovery from the Dark Ages might not have been so successful or even possible without Islam. Columbus would have never made it to the New World. Islam gave women dignity and rights that they never had before. It leveled the educational playing field and gave everyone the opportunity to learn, to attend higher education and universities, and it opened the way for everyone, regardless of religion or gender, to better themselves, hindered only by their own level of ambition and desire to be successful. Islam and the Prophet Muhammad also restored peace in Arabia and beyond. This was possible through his lead by example, by his rational approach in dealing with the matters he faced, and by his character. Islam's teachings are the same today as they were in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Over 1.7 billion Muslims are drawn to Islam and Muhammad's teachings for this reason, as well as spirituality, justice, a strong belief in God, and countless other reasons. They are just as inspired by the teachings of Jesus, Moses, and Abraham as they are in Muhammad's teachings. Islam transcends barriers, building fraternity between all people, whether they are Christians, Jews, or other ethnic or non-ethnic communities. It should not be surprising that Christians and Jews can read about Jesus Christ, Moses, Abraham, and all the prophets of the Old Testament and the Holy Quran. It is true that the messages of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are different, but at their core, these religions are closer than you may think or want to think, but there is no denying of what is true. Peace builds human dignity and is also considered a victory. Pope John Paul II said, everyone knows that violence always spawns violence. War throws open the doors to the abyss of evil, War, therefore, must always be considered a defeat, a defeat of reason and humanity. Thus, may there soon be a spiritual and cultural impulse that will induce people to ban war. Yes, war, never again. Christians, Jews, and Muslims all teach about a global peace, loving their neighbor, and accepting of others who are different. Let's all, whether we be Jews, Christians, or Muslims, learn about each other's religions, not so that we can see the differences, but that we can rejoice in the similarities.